Hi, everyone. This is Carol Razzo from ElderWorks, and we appreciate you joining us today. Um, please be sure that you are on mute and that you have your video off. We'll be starting shortly, uh, but we appreciate you coming in today. So uh, please just get settled and we'll start in a few moments. Thank you. I think there's about 30 for today, I was told, Carol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was the number that uh, the office sent out to us, I think. Good morning, everyone. It's Carol Brazo from ElderWorks. We appreciate you joining us today. We'll be starting in a few moments. Please be sure that your um, information or your computer or phone are on mute and that your video is off. And we'll be with you in just a few moments. Also, if you're coming on for continuing education credit. Uh, you will need to be on for the entire time and you have received or should have received when you register uh, or when you go out, you will receive an evaluation. And then once that's completed, we will send you um, the continuing education credit. We'll be with you in just a few moments. Mary Lou, did you have a question? Go ahead. You can't, I see your question. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I did ask you to mute, but I was just reminded by Emily, thank you very much at the office that um, you cannot mute because we're on a webinar. So that's fine. Just go right ahead. 
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, 10 o'clock, so we're going to start in just a few moments. Uh, this is Carol Ann uh, Razzo from Elder Works, and um, appreciate all of you coming on today. Uh, this will be a webinar, and in addition to that, we will be giving continuing education credit, so please stay on for the entire time. Fill out the uh, evaluation at the end, once we receive it, we will in fact uh, send you over your CE credit. Um, let me just answer a question. Okay, let me just put something here right in there in the box. Okay, I just understood this was consumers only. My apology, I thought we were giving CE credit as well. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and you cannot mute, so you should be able to hear us now. I have one question from Mary Lou. Emily, can you respond to her if there's a problem? I'd appreciate it. So we're gonna go ahead and start uh, momentarily. Uh, today's session is Brain Health and the Aging Brain. And um, we're delighted to have Chris Petrick, uh, nurse and our educational and program person from ElderWorks with us. And Chris is going to go ahead and start this session. So Chris, please go on, uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Hi, everyone. As Carol said, my name is Chris Petrick. I'm the director of um, education for Elder Works, and I'll be talking to you about brain health today. Um, I'm a registered nurse, and uh, I've been practicing nursing for quite a long time. Uh, let's just say Florence Nightingale and I went to school together. Um, I've been in healthcare over 40 years, and um, my background is varied, but the last um, 17 years have been in education and dementia care. Uh, so today we're going to talk about brain health and aging. And before we do, um, I just want to um, go ahead and um, I'm going to hide this video panel so it's not in your way. And uh, there we go. Okay, so, oops, I just skipped a, um, for whatever reason, it is not showing my objectives. Let me uh, see why that is doing that. Oh, well. Um, So it's not showing my objective screen, uh, but let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about um, normal versus non-normal aging in the brain, signs of cognitive impairment, the six pillars of brain health, brain plasticity, I'll be explaining that, and then tips and tricks to keep your brain um, updated and, and fresh and new. So what is normal aging? Normal aging is characterized by a general slowing of uh, cognitive performance. So older adults typically perform worse than younger adults or tasks of attention and episodic and working memory, but, but better on tests of general knowledge than younger persons. A lot, a lot of that has to do with our long-term memory. We do see that there's a decrease in uh, mental flexibility. And what I mean by that is kind of thinking outside the box, um, not sticking to a rigid routine. Uh, older adults find comfort. Um, I'm sorry about that, guys. I don't know what's going on with my computer today. But um, older adults um, in general find comfort and safety in a specific routine. And being able to kind of um, think differently is what we call mental flexibility. They do have some difficulty in finding the right word. Um, 
but aging does not really appear to negatively influence verbal fluency. So we're really not losing anything but that specific word at that time. We'll talk about that um, because um, you know that happens to me as well. And I wanna talk about some tricks on, on how you can recall that. Aging does appear um, to neg uh, does not negatively influence verbal uh, fluency, but our older adults retain their verbal abilities, including our vocabulary. It may take a little bit longer to remember a name or a word. Um, there may be difficulties retrieving the word, but the information is not lost. And we will see a mild decrease in short-term or working memory. <clears throat> However, recall of past events or long-term memories remains intact. Memories um, is intact of our current events. Older people can name our current president or discuss recent major current events, and they might express more concern to their family physician about forgetting names or words than to their family or friends. But if they were to undergo that formal testing, you would find that they would demonstrate performance with a normal range. I have to tell you, kind of a funny thing, um, being in healthcare, and I'm sure talking to older adults, you may also know that um, <clears throat> when they uh, do a, a very uh, quick dementia type test in the physician's office, they ask you a couple of things. And one of the things they ask you to do is count back by seven. Well, math has never been my forte. And so when I saw my doctor the other day for uh, just a minor issue, and he said, well, I'll see you in April for your annual physical. And I said, yes, and I'm practicing counting back by seven because I certainly don't wanna fail that. So we know that there's those uh, more of those informal tests and then those formal tests that we see. Also, you'll see changes in perceptual systems or speed of processing associated with normal aging. And that can influence cognitive processes such as attention and memory. Um, in addition, people retain independence in both basic and instrumental activities. So ADL stands for activities of daily living. <clears throat> and activities of daily living are bathing, toileting, getting yourself dressed. So those are activities of daily living. What we call IADLs, <coughs> excuse me, are those instrumental activities of daily living. Um, and that is really talking about <clears throat> driving a car, doing your bills, um, you know, uh, following a recipe, things like that. So we'll start to see um, that uh, their inability to perform those activities, instrumental activities of daily living, really um, will precede their uh, inability to perform their basic um, daily tasks. Of, of um, personal hygiene and such. We look at the brain as um, really the, the, the function and the center of function for our whole body. It does just about everything that we need it to. It all starts in the brain. However, it's the size of a medium cauliflower. So it's, uh, there's a lot of things packed in to about three pounds we lose about um, 0.5 to 1% of its volume each year after 60. <clears throat> um, I will say that with Alzheimer's, you're gonna lose about a pound of your brain. There's two, um, there's two uh, things that are in our brain that are extremely in, in important in the function. And those are our neurons and our synapses. That's what sends the signals. That's what connects one uh, neuron to the other. And we look at the size of the, how many there is. There's a billion neurons and a trillion synapses. So again, <clears throat> really packed with power when we look at the brain. The brain controls almost all of our aspects of thinking, remembering, planning, organizing, um, making decisions, and, and much more. These cognitive abilities affect how we do everyday tasks and whether we can live independently. Some changes in thinking are common as we get older. For example, older adults might, like I said, have more difficulty with word finding or recalling names. 
more problems with multitasking. I find I was a very good multitasker when I was younger. Um, they probably would diagnose that with ADD now, but um, I could really do several things at one time quite well. And now in my older years, I find that I have to kind of separate those out and, and concentrate on one thing at a time. And that's pretty normal. <clears throat> you might see mild decreases in the ability to pay attention. However, aging brings along some positive cognitive changes. People, um, older people often have more knowledge and insight from a lifetime of experience. Research shows that older adults still can learn new things, create new memories, and improve their vocabulary and their language skills. So, and we'll talk about how we can do some of that. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are changes in the brain. As a person gets older, changes occur in all parts of the body, including the brain. Certain parts of the brain shrink, especially those important to learning and other complex mental activities. In certain brain regions, communication between neurons, which are those nerve cells, can be reduced. We also see that blood flow in the brain can also decrease. It decreases um, just because of age in itself. But if we have those what we call comorbidities, which is our, those diseases um, that may influence a uh, lack of uh, oxygen and blood flow to different parts of our body, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, vascular disease, we'll see an increase in that blood flow. And remember that blood flow brings um, healthy uh, oxygen to feed those neurons, which are the nerve cells in our brain. Inflammation, which occurs when the body responds to an injury or disease can also increase. And so these changes in the brain uh, can affect mental fun function, even in healthy older people. So we really have to think about um, when we talk about inflammation, how we can reduce the inflammation in our brain. Uh, some older adults find that they don't do well as younger people on complex memory or learning tests, but given enough time, they can do well. So our processing time becomes a little bit longer. We can still um, get that information, but it takes us a little longer to process that. So if you remember that game, um, I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. Um, it was on probably 10, 15 years ago. They had a fifth grader challenging an adult on um, various topics. And uh, if you remember, almost always the fifth grader won. And when I was talking about brain health and I was in a um, conference with a group of people who were all talking about the brain and brain health and what happens to the brain, the, the one professor that was present said, think of your brain as a file cabinet. And as we um, get new information, we put it in that file cabinet, okay? And we keep putting that information over the years, over the decades, more information in that file cabinet. But really what stays at the center, or I'm sorry, at the front of that file cabinet is the things that are most important to us. So as a, a, you know, a 56 year old man who's on this TV program, is it important him, for him to know what the, um, what the capital of Florida is? I don't think so. Maybe if he's a politician in Florida, it might be, or um, if he's an architect in Florida, he might need to know because he needs to maybe go there to um, get his plans uh, um, approved. But for myself as a nurse, do I really need to know what the capital of Florida is? So that goes to the back of my file cabinet. Now, I might still have that information there, but think of it as this kind of filing through, rummaging through that file cabinet to retrieve that information. It takes us a little bit longer to do that. There is growing evidence that the brain remains plastic, and that's what we call brain plasticity that we'll talk about in a minute, which means we're really able to adapt to new challenges and tasks, even as we age. 
it's not clear why some people as they get older while others um, don't really, um, their brain does well. One possible reason is what we have, what they call is cognitive reserve. And that's the brain's ability to work well, even when some part of the, uh, the brain is disrupted. And what they have found is that people with more education seem to have more of a cognitive reserve than other people do who um, are less educated. So let's talk about those neurons that I mentioned in our brain. Those neurons, or what we call the nerve cells, is really um, the part of the brain that, um, that functions and sends impulses and thought processes and um, the, uh, the thought process to move to the right or to the left or walk or speak or listen. Um, those are all from the impulses of the nerves or the neurons. And so there's really a use it or a lose it um, ideology on that. So learning and performing new activities will result in increased connections between neurons. Also performing activities repetitively enforces those connections. So you can do something very simple every day. If you um, typically are a person, this is gonna sound silly, but if you're typically a person uh, because your right handed brushes your, your hair with your right arm, your right hand, or you brush your teeth with your right hand, later on today when you brush your teeth again, or tomorrow morning when you get up and brush your teeth or you're combing your hair, use your left hand, use your non-dominant hand to do that. When you get up and get dressed in the morning, um, think about that process and what you do first. Do you put on your pants first? Do you put on your socks first? And change it up a little bit. That's sometimes that's those little things will help form new synapses in the brain. There is some wear and tear, and we know that age presents a de decrease in the amount of what we call the white matter and the functioning of mitochondria. And we're really getting down to the cellular level. Um, and, but we do know that various medical, genetic, and environmental and lifestyle factors can influence declines in cellular functioning. They're really worried about Alzheimer's dis disease by the, um, by the year 2050 because they really think there's gonna be an increase in it. And as they do their research, they're looking at the environment, they're looking at um, people's medical histories and uh, what it's doing to the cellular function. They do know that um, farmers and people who work with pesticides have a higher rate of Parkinson's disease than people who don't. Now that's not to say if you get Parkinson's, you're not gonna get Parkinson's disease because um, you're not a farmer, but the thought process is that environment really has a lot to play on how we're aging. Normal aging is also associated with slightly diminished cerebral flow, which may contribute to the white matter changes. And like I said, um, uh, there is just a normal change in that blood supply, but what puts you at higher risk for more of a decreased blood supply would be a cardiovascular event like a stroke or a, a TIA, a trans uh, ischemic event, um, or uh, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, anything that changes that blood supply is going to contribute to the decrease in, um, in the brain. And again, we know that um, blood supply brings that ox oxygen and nourishment to those brain cells, those neurons, those lobes to make sure that they're living properly. This is just a, an example of a, a PET scan and a PET scan um, really picks up on heat um, it's, uh, it's a thermal test. And here we can see the normal brain. You can see the lobes in the brain. You can see a lot of um, the, the red is really the vascularity in the white matter. And then we have someone with mild cognitive impairment. And you can see that there's a decrease in the vascularity. And you can see that there's less um, cellular function in the lobes. 
And then we look at Alzheimer's disease and you can see the difference from here to here and it's quite a change. So normal aging does lead to changes in all five of the senses. Um, as we age, it becomes more difficult to see in here with the same clarity we had in our younger years, impairment in vision, speech, hearing are common in normal aging. Conditions such as cataracts, glaucoma, and hearing are common. Uh, macular degeneration um, is more common in, in, uh, in older age. They're doing a lot of studies on hearing and Alzheimer's disease, and they're finding that people who don't wear their hearing aids or don't have hearing aids but are hearing impaired um, have a, a higher risk of dementia. We know that age-related decline in both auditory process and cognitive abilities may influence the processing. And so um, we really need to think about how we can improve that ourselves, um, making sure that we see better um, by getting our annual exams, um, making sure that uh, we're having our hearing tested and then doing something about it. And I know it's very difficult. I wear hearing aids myself. They're very, very expensive. Um, however, here's a little side note. Um, there is a big store um, that has hearing aids in it and they're much, much cheaper than going to an audiologist. Obviously I can't promote any store, but it begins with a C. You need to have a membership. Um, and um, uh, if you're looking for hearing aids, that might be the place that you can find uh, financially reasonable. Um, let me address this um, change in taste and smell. Um, unfortunately, this is one of the side effects of COVID. And for some people, this may never return um, because we know that COVID does affect um, the brain. People are experiencing severe headaches with COVID. And we know that they're having um, episodes of brain fog, episodes of not being able to taste or smell. Um, and for some people it returns and some people, uh, which we're calling the long haulers, um, that doesn't return for months. And some people are not seeing it return even after a year or so. I think the jury's out on that. We'll see long-term if that happens. What I do wanna tell you is that smell um, what they're looking at is that a lack of smell might be a um, first sign or a precursor to um, Alzheimer's disease. That uh, when they're talking to people and they're getting a history, then they said, you know, a year or two before I started having these cognitive symptoms, I noticed that my lack of, I was having a lack of smell. So they are doing more studies on that. This is just, um, I think this is pretty enlightening and very positive on aging and cognitive abilities. Aging is a natural process and with it come changes in memory. Most people associate aging with declines in cognitive performance. My mom will say she's having a senior moment when she forgets something, for example. But never fear, not all cognitive changes in adulthood are negative. Some abilities remain relatively stable and some even improve. So let's start with the positive. Abilities that remain stable. First of all, implicit memory stays about the same across the lifespan. In other words, once you've learned to ride a bike, that procedural memory is likely to stay with you as you age, barring any brain damage or disease. Recognition memory also stays relatively stable over time, meaning that once you learn something, your ability to pick it out of a list later remains about the same, whether you're 27 or 67. Now for abilities that improve. Semantic memory improves until around age 60 and only then starts declining. This means that older adults still have good verbal skills and why they make excellent crossword puzzle buddies. A related area in which older adults tend to score better than younger adults is crystallized intelligence which involves the ability to use knowledge and experience. Since older adults have had more time to gain knowledge and experience, this pattern makes sense. And crystallized intelligence is often tested with reading comprehension and analogy tests. So older adults tend to be better at those than younger adults. 
Finally, older adults tend to be better at reasoning in the face of interpersonal or emotionally charged problems. Again, the theory is that with their greater experience and knowledge of these types of situations, they're more likely to have been through some similar situation and be able to draw from that experience. Of course, there are some cognitive abilities that decline as we age. Recall becomes more difficult. Although recognition is stable, it's harder for older adults than younger adults to generate responses without cues, like there are in a free recall or sometimes cued recall test. Similarly, episodic memory is impaired. Often, memories formed a long time ago will be relatively stable, but forming new episodic memories becomes more difficult as we age. Processing speed slows down as we age, so if you're watching Jeopardy with Grandma, she might know just as many answers as you do, if not more, but she'll have a harder time outputting the response within such a short period of time. Related to processing speed, divided attention becomes more difficult. As we age, it becomes increasingly harder to effectively switch our attention between tasks, so we become more easily distracted. The bottom line is that cognitive changes in adulthood aren't all negative. Although some cognitive abilities do decline, it's important to remember that in healthy older adults, some cognitive abilities will remain stable or even improve. So to kind of add to the positivity of that, um, just keep in mind that uh, Giuseppe Verdi uh, was still composing operas in his late 80s. Frank Lloyd Wright designed his last building at the age of 89. And Robert Frost and George Bernard Shaw and Georgia O'Keeffe were all performing in their various arts well into their 90s. And I think our most current example of that is, unfortunately, she has just passed, Betty White. But um, Betty was one of those people who was always thinking, um, advocating, and moving forward. And um, by doing many of those things that she did, she was really keeping that brain sharp. So let's talk about some of the cognitive changes in normal aging. The stable or improving is our functional uh, language, our simple attention span, knowledge of general facts, and everyday problem solving. And then declining again would be word retrieval. Um, learning, and <clears throat> learning and memory are affected. Executive functions, higher level attention and mental processing speed. So our speed is definitely down. Um, higher, uh, I'm sorry, executive function, those are making um, complicated, some complicated decisions um, to very simple decisions. And I just wanna tell you that it's really the more complicated decisions we may have a problem with as opposed to, should I wear a winter coat today because it's only gonna be minus four. So um, when we talk about executive function, there's, there's kind of a wide range of that. Um, here's, I found this interesting, cognitive complaints um, in normal individuals who do not have mild cognitive impairment or dementia for getting phone numbers. Um, I think it's much higher than that. I, um, I know my phone number and I know my husband's phone number. But every, everything else, um, and I know those because I have to put those on forms, but anybody else is in my, my phone book in my, my phone. And I think that has crippled us in a memory area um, where we don't remember um, phone numbers. Forget people's names. I was always very good at names. And I still remember names of people that I know. But for some reason, movie stars. Now, is that a big deal? Does that impact my life? Do I... Do I really need to know who um, you know, Tom Hanks is? Probably not. Um, but I find it frustrating for myself that I can't recall that name. Um, forgets where their, that should be, I'm sorry, where their car is parked. Um, thank God we have little uh, things on our, our, um, our keys where we can click and we can hear the beep of our car. So if you have a good auditory response, it sends you in the direction of your car. Um, but, you know, I, I remember a time and, and it wasn't, um, I, it wasn't in my 60s, that's for sure, because I haven't been to Woodfield in, you know, over two years. But uh, I went to Woodfield and I walked into JCPenney's, did my shopping and I walked out. 
and I walked out, I could not find my car. And I looked for about an hour and I have to say I was in my forties at the time and I was panicked until I thought to myself, maybe I walked out the wrong door because there are several doors you can walk out at, at a mall, at a store like Penny's. So I went back in and I tried to retrace my steps, which just shows that I had that cognition intact. And I remembered that I had walked in by, let's say women's clothing, and I walked out that door and I found my car. So what I do now, whenever I go into a store that has more than one entrance is I say out loud and people might think I'm crazy, but that's a trick to cement it in your brain is saying it out loud, uh, women's clothing, men's clothing, uh, home improvement. And so I'm taking that idea of where I parked my car and, and implanting it in my brain by saying it out loud. Um, my husband always has, we have an attached garage to our house. And so he's always very concerned that he's left the garage door open when he leaves, leaves for work. And um, one day we were talking and he said, you know, I circled the block again to come home. And I said, say I'm closing the garage door or do garage door closed out loud as soon as you're pulling out of the garage and you see that door close and he hasn't had to circle the, the, um, the neighborhood again. So forgetting groceries, forgetting why they entered a room, forgetting directions, forgetting appointment dates, write them down, loses items around the house and loses wallet or purse. I lose my glasses probably three times every day. I lose my phone. Um, that's pretty normal. Um, has anyone been on their phone and looked for their phone? I know people who have done that, and I will admit that I'm one of those people. Now let's talk about signs of cognitive impairment. That's really increasing forgetfulness or difficulty learning new tasks, uh, frequent repetition, changes in, in ability to perform daily tasks, changes in mood and behavior. We'll see some social withdrawal getting lost in familiar places, problems with speech and language, changes in hygiene, um, beginning with the suspiciousness and then some judgment problems. So those are a little different than what we have talked about. So does the brain always decline? I guess that's the big question is, is it gonna decline? And we know that um, it does decline somewhat, but we know that brain function need not decline with age. Um, significantly, at least for people who stay healthy and mentally active. Research shows that a lifetime of vigorous learning helps prevent or delay Alzheimer's disease. So I, I talked, um, I had mentioned neuroplasticity. So what does that really mean? And it's the ability of the brain to form new connections. There's those neurons, those nerves, that, that uh, neural pathway to form new connections and pathways and change uh, how it circuits and, and wired. Neurogenesis is the even more amazing ability of the brain to grow new neurons. Now, back in the day, I, I'm, when I was younger and maybe when you were younger yourself and someone had a brain injury, um, there was, well, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. And um, we, we didn't challenge that person to do better than what they were um, cognitively post um, uh, their event that caused them this brain damage. What we know now is many decades later is that there is the ability of the brain to form these new connections. And so you'll look at the rehab from a traumatic act brain accident of 40 years ago, very, very different than what it is today. So how can we keep our brain healthy? What can we do um, to, to um, be thinking and be able to develop new um, brain skills, brain uh, neurons, I'm sorry. And that's really the six pillars of brain health. And the six uh, pillars of brain health, and I'll go over each of these um, separately, is regular exercise, social engagement, healthy diet, mental stimulation, so brain activities, quality sleep, and stress management. We'll talk about each of one of these individually. So let's talk about mental fitness first. 
how do you exercise your brain? Well, obviously it's a lot different than exercising your body, but there's various ways that you can do it. I have a friend who's 73 and she's taking piano lessons right now. So learning to play a musical instrument, um, that's not something that I want to do. I think you have to have the passion or the desire to do that, um, but she's doing quite well. She's never going to be a concert pianist, but she's learning to play something that she always wanted to do and never had the time to do. She was a single mom. She's also a nurse. She had three boys to raise, but now she is playing the piano. Um, playing a word game, and that was one thing that Betty White did once a week. She challenged her friend to a game of Scrabble. And lo and behold, if she lost, um, she was apparently a very bad loser. She had very good um, word sense and she was hard to beat at Scrabble. Doing crossword puzzles, word search puzzles, um, those are all ways that you can um, develop your uh, new synapses. Now, at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you some ways that you can do that, but um, you can pull any of these um, ideas out online too. Uh, interacting with others, that has been so difficult the last two years is interacting with others. And I know we all feel like we're back where we started and things have gotten worse again. Um, and so we're all hunkering down again and um, but, you know, coming on to something like this, uh, doing, I, I know our library had um, uh, tours that you could take virtually of um, different countries. And there was a narrator who actually was a uh, tour guide on uh, one of the major um, tour lines. So she, uh, she did a tour once a week of a different country. So checking out with your library, if they have any online programs, starting a new hobby. Uh, and so um, you know, one of the things I've started doing again, I put it away for a while, but I started crocheting. Um, I know one or two stitches and I just went on YouTube and typed in crochet stitches. And now I'm just practicing new stitches. Not very good. And I probably will never make the Afghan of my dreams, but it's keeping that brain moving. Learning a foreign language, we know that as an adult, learning a foreign language is um, a little bit harder. Um, I know that when we went to Italy a couple uh, years ago, well, it's been more than a couple years, 10 years ago, my husband wanted to learn Italian um, so he could interact. And uh, so he took one of those crash courses and, um, and did okay. He was able to ask for change, order, and ask where the bathroom was. So um, didn't uh, help 100% where when he was younger, um, you know, he was able to do that quicker. He actually was um, bilingual when he was young because his parents are from Czechoslovakia. Volunteering. Um, volunteering is always a way to um, give some quality to your life. Um, I have to share with you that um, uh, I'm taking a new uh, medication for my allergies and, um, and I had a dream, I'm having really crazy dreams, but the dream I had last night was I got fired from my volunteer job. And I thought, um, I woke up not feeling really good about my staying informed about uh, world class events. I think um, there's um, there's a, a, a line to cross with that, though. I know you turn on the news and it's negative, negative, negative. So, um, you know, limit your news intake to maybe once a day, if that, um, if, you know, kind of get away from being a news junkie because it's all negative, but keeping abreast of world events is important. Taking classes and um, socializing. Again, very, very important to stay involved and active. And those are the things that are going to exercise your brain. The next thing that um, you can do is uh, eat a healthy diet. Eating a healthy diet for brain power is very important. Um, so you want to think about the foods that you're taking. Many of us, and myself included, especially during the holidays, have, um, have included a high uh, sugar, high carb, high fat diet. 
um, into their lifestyle because the holidays does that to us. But uh, um, this is a good time to think about what you're putting in your mouth. Um, you know, uh, fatty fish, salmon, trout, sardines are all good fishes to eat. Uh, coffee, um, you know, that's kind of uh, coffee's good, coffee's bad, coffee's good. Um, and the, the new studies does show that coffee is good for you. Um, again, I'm not sure what that'll be next year because it seems to change every couple of years, but right now coffee's good for you. Blueberries and other deeply colored berries <clears throat> are great and should be included in your diet at least once a day. Um, I know for many people, that's a struggle right now financially. Um, I went to the store the other day and I saw a, a small crate of blueberries and they were, I'm sorry, strawberries and they were $7.99. Um, like my daughter said yesterday, um, with a family of four, that, that crate of um, small green crate that you buy at the store of blue uh, strawberries is going to be a serving for their family. And so you kind of have to think about, um, is it worth it? But we talked about it and I said, so why don't you get frozen strawberries and make smoothies for the girls and they'll get their strawberries and some of their berries that way. Turmeric, great for inflammation. Um, I take turmeric once a day. Um, I take it in a pill, it doesn't have a taste and uh, you can get it in drop form too, a little bit more concentrated, but um, turmeric has been shown to reduce inflammation. So if you don't like cooking with turmeric, you can get it at, um, in your uh, vitamin section. Broccoli, pumpkin seeds, uh, dark chocolate. Remember that um, when you're choosing your chocolate, the darker it is, the better it is for you. <clears throat> I find that the darker it is, the more bitter it tastes. So, um, you know, I, I tend to stay around 80% on my dark chocolate because once it gets higher than that, it's, it just isn't appealing to me. But but not eating, again, it's, it's in moderation. Sitting down and having a piece of chocolate isn't a bad thing. Dark chocolate isn't a bad thing every night. It's if you consume the whole bar every night. And here are some of your others. We know that the um, egg whites are the better part of the egg to take in. And then we know that green tea is also good for you. A lot of them have great benefits. And um, again, if you go online, and uh, you know, just Google um, important foods for healthy lifestyles, you'll find a gazillion uh, websites that will tell you how and what you should be eating. Uh, the Mayo Clinic diet is getting a lot of um, hype right now. And really it's just a basic diet that really has you eating um, from every food group. So again, um, it goes back to the basics. Physical exercise is extremely important. Um, we need to think about exercising at least once a day. Um, we have uh, for 20 to 30 minutes, um, we have our um, FIT program again starting um, this month. So, um, you know, we have prizes for the people who have done um, and stayed steady with their fitness. Uh, it doesn't have to be standing. It can be chair exercises. If you go on our website um, and you look at ElderWorks, they do have some exercises that you can do. You can also go to YouTube. Uh, there's a nice um, exercise program on YouTube that is for older adults. So if you just type in older adult exercises, um, it's a little bit slower paced. Some of them are in chairs. So again, um, something that you can do even if you may have some arthritis. What does physical um, exercise do for you? Well, first of all, it increases the heart rate, which pumps more oxygen to your brain. And we've talked about getting that oxygen to your brain. It also helps release those good hormones that provide a, a good environment for growth of new brain cells. If you're always in a chronic stress mode, um, you're never going to release those good hormones. You're releasing the bad hormones that are will negatively impact your brain. But when you exercise, you're, um, you're releasing those good endorphins and that provides a good in, environment for those neurons to develop. And so it does promote brain plasticity. And again, that stimulates new connections 
between cells. And that's really um, very important for your brain. So this uh, little um, video talks about exercise and what it does to your brain. Exercise is good for your body and your brain. <clears throat> Here's what happens to your brain when you exercise. Your heart rate speeds up and your body starts to work hard. Your brain recognizes these responses as stressors and responds by releasing chemicals that protect you from stress. BDNF and endorphins. BDNF repairs and protects your memory neurons and clears your mind so you can make good decisions. Exercise also increases blood flow to the brain, improving brain cell activity and focus. Increased oxygen in the brain as a result of increased blood flow creates new cells in the parts of your brain that control learning and memory. Endorphins help reduce discomfort, block feelings of pain, and cause pleasure. These feelings can last for hours after you have finished exercising, which is why you feel happier, more relaxed, and less stressed after a workout. Regular exercise over a long period of time can help protect you from anxiety and depression, increase brain cell function, improve your memory, and may help prevent many diseases. Regular exercise may also improve your self-esteem as you feel more confident about your looks and what you can do. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that adults get at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. Just 30 minutes a day of walking, moving around, or even dancing can build a stronger, healthier brain. So I encourage all of you to exercise. I know it's very hard to get out on these really cold days, um, <clears throat> but you can um, do this exercise, uh, these exercises in your house. When I'm working from home, which I do um, just about every day, <clears throat> I um, have an app on my phone that um, alarms every 20 minutes and every 20 minutes I get up and I make a circuit of my house and I sit down um, and get back to work. It's really important for blood flow that you get up and do this. Um, I just thought this picture was interesting. It shows the brain after uh, sitting quietly and you can see there's no, there really no blood flow at all that I can see. Um, and then after a 20 minute walk, and you can see the, the color, the brains, the, the lobes of the brain light up. Um, so again, really important to um, get out and exercise. So older adults need about the same amount of sleep as all adults, um, seven to nine hours. Um, and I have to tell you that they're doing studies right now with Alzheimer's disease and sleep. And they're showing that people who sleep less than seven to eight hours a night have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I think everybody, but everybody's body is, is made differently. Um, and so I, I know for my husband, he gets just, just about seven hours of sleep. Sometimes it's six hours. Um, his body automatically wakes up at 530 in the morning. And it might be related to the fact that he got up that um, early for, you know, uh, 45 some years when he was working full time. And I think your body, um, kind of your brain is just kind of set in that. Uh, so, but for the average, it's about seven to eight hours is, is a good um, time to sleep. And there's a lot of reasons why older adults don't get enough sleep. Uh, feeling sick, such as being in pain, makes it hard to sleep. Some medicines uh, can keep you awake. Um, maybe being irritable um, and, and just restless because of um, maybe the day's events. But um, we know that not getting enough sleep will cause you to be more irritable. You will have more memory uh, problems and being more forgetful when you're sleep deprived. You'll have a tendency to more, be more depressed and very important, you'll have a higher risk for falls. And we really don't want anybody to be falling. Um, just let me throw the statistic out there and uh, let you know that 70% of the people over 70, 70% 70 of the people over 70 who fall and break a hip die within 18 months. So your job is an, as an older adult is to stay upright and all the things that we're talking about here, healthy diet, exercise, brain games, are all things that are going to keep you helping, uh, will help you stand up and, and move forward. 
So <clears throat> mindful meditation, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that it does is it changes for positive gray matter. Um, it changes the volume of the gray matter in the brain. It also reduces the activity in the me centers of the brain. As we get older, our me center of the brain becomes more focused, um, more prominent. And um, sometimes being centered on yourself all the time isn't healthy. So when you do mindful meditation, it really helps reduce that activity in the me center of your brain, which is more of the frontal lobe. That's where your personality and your emotions are. You'll see uh, with mindful meditation and enhan enhanced connectivity between brain regions. We know that mindful meditation can be done everywhere. You don't need to be like this gentleman sitting on a floor in a class with your, um, you know, your index finger and your um, thumb on his knees. That can be done sitting in a chair. It can be done sitting on a bus. It can be done anywhere. But it frees the uh, brain from anxiety, anger, and toxic thoughts. There is um, an association between mind wandering and being less happy. And so when you do mindful meditation, you're focusing on it. Um, oftentimes people <clears throat> uh, do mindful meditation in the morning and it is advised that you do mindful meditation before you do anything else such as look at your phone. And if you do mindful meditation um, immediately before you go to bed, people have said that they get a better night's sleep. Now, what is mindful meditation? It's just focusing on one thing. It's focusing on um, maybe gratitude. It's focusing on nature. It is taking your mind off of all the, the, the noise that you've had in your brain all day, clearing it of that, and just focusing on one thing. You can do it in complete silence. I prefer to do my mind. I like classical music. <clears throat> and so um, I think better when there's noise in the background. And so um, when I'm doing meditation, I am doing it with a little bit of, of sound of, uh, of a quiet um, classical music in the background, but you really don't have to have anything. Um, my son, who's a firefighter, meditates every day. It's the one thing that helps him kind of get centered. He gets up in the morning and before he gets out of bed and before he showers, he sits in bed. He thinks about what his, um, you know, what his purpose in life is um, and kind of the positives. And then he gets on and moves on uh, with the rest of his day. We talk about social interaction and how disrupted that has been through this pandemic. And really it's been very difficult, but I really encourage you to find some way um, to interact with people, um, keeping a social distance, keeping your masks on, but visiting with people is extremely, extremely important. Um, I know some people um, because of the pandemic have gone into a depression. There's they've shown an increase in anxiety. <clears throat> and one of the things that causes that depression and anxiety is social isolation. It actually causes changes in the chemistry of your brain. So do what you can to get um, socially engaged with something. Okay, so here's some um, strategies for adults for um, memory. So think about this. Nowadays, a lot of people are obsessed with a healthy lifestyle. They eat wholesome food, work out at the gym, and all that jazz. But they tend to forget that our brain needs exercise too. Especially if you've started having memory lapses more often. Um, what did I just say? Oh yeah. So if people keep saying you have the memory of a goldfish, don't fret. Just try these simple brain exercises to help you out. Number 1. Read books aloud. In 2017, the University of Waterloo conducted an experiment where they asked 95 participants to read silently, listen to someone else read, listen to a recording of themselves reading, and read out loud in real time. Later, participants were required to repeat words they read. It turned out the word recall was greatest in the group that read aloud to themselves. 
When you speak and hear yourself speaking at the same time, it helps the brain to store the information. You can practice this exercise with your friend or a child. Also, you can try to switch to audiobooks. Listening to them engages the imagination and brain regions in a different way than silent reading. Number 2. Switch hands during daily activities. Only 1% of the world doesn't have a dominant hand. Everyone else uses either the right one or the left one to read, cut food, paint, and so on. But if you try to switch to your other hand, it'll strengthen neural connections in your brain, making your mind and memory sharper. Use your opposite hand while brushing your teeth, cleaning, or washing the dishes. But hey, please don't try this exercise while you're driving or doing brain surgery. It might seem really hard the first time you do it, but it'll give your brain the perfect kind of stimulation by adjusting. Just keep practicing this exercise regularly. Number 3. Elevate your heart rate three times a week. Regular aerobic exercise may increase the size of the hippocampus. No, that's not the University of Hippo. It's the part of the brain responsible for transforming information into new memories. A study published in 2011 backs up the idea about the positive impact working out has on our memory. According to it, aerobic exercises that pump up your heart rate help the brain store long-term memories. But even if breaking a sweat at the gym isn't exactly your thing, you can just take a brisk walk for 20 minutes, three times a week, and still get the same effect. 4. Eat with chopsticks It's one of the most effective ways to make your brain perform better. And here's how it works. Using chopsticks grows new dendrites, which are extensions of nerve cells. They help to transmit impulses from cell to cell. This means that these dendrites have a positive impact on communication between brain cells. What's more, involving the concentrated areas of nerve cells in your fingertips in this activity boosts the circulation in the brain. And as a bonus, switching to chopsticks improves your digestion and helps control calorie intake. Because it's so hard. So that's some of the um, some of the ways. I've got one more thing I want to show you. Oops. Um, let me see if I can find it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, I think I took it out. Um, but let's do this one. This is another way to exercise your brain. To admit that last one was kind of hard for me. I only saw the the golden white dress. Um, <clears throat> but again, these are ways that you can exercise your brain. All of these um, that I have on the left here are all things that I have pulled from YouTube. Lots, tons of. You don't have to sign up for anything. I know there's a lot of companies out there that charge you an annual uh, fee for um, brain exercises, and that certainly is not necessary. So um, that really is the end uh, of my presentation. I want to thank you all for um, coming today. And you all have developed new neurons and new synapses today because you attended this. Not only did you learn something new, 
but um, you've engaged your brain and um, hopefully you'll take some of this information with you. Um, if there's any questions, um, you wanna go ahead and put them in the question and answer or I'll open it up for discussion. Uh, Chris, we did have one question. Has there been any confirmation or research that Prevagen um, is helpful? It does any good, any scientific evidence? That prednisone? Prevagen, Prevagen, P-R-E-V-A-G. Oh, Prevagen, Prevagen. Thank you, um, thank you. You mean like uh, SAS and um, Norm? Yeah, <laughs> the two exactly. I'm exactly. SAS, your Norm. You know, the verdict is out on that. I mean, the verdict is not out on that. Um, the studies that I've seen says it really doesn't help much. My sister's taking it right now. She's actually taking the Costco version. Um, she says that uh, she feels a little bit of a difference. Um, you have to take it for a while before you actually start to feel any difference. I understand she's, she's two months into this and uh, she's three years older than me and She's fine, but you know, we all feel that we could spark it up a little bit. Um, but um, uh, it's expensive and I think you're supposed to take it two to three times a day. I know Prevagen um, is very expensive, which is why she bought the Costco brand. Um, so if, if you talk to some neurologists, they'll say, yes, it works and other people say no. I say, if it's not gonna hurt you and you have the money to buy it, why not? Um, I think exercising your brain is really important and a whole lot cheaper, but if you can add that to it, it's like anything else, it certainly isn't going to hurt. Um, we have another question. If you could repeat the statistic and the information uh, of people falling F once they're 70 and breaking a hip. Yes. Um, and it may have changed, it may have increased, but um, I got that statistic from a conference on falls that I went to. And they said 70% of people over 70 who fall will, um, will uh, be deceased within the first year. And unfortunately, I have to tell you, my father was a perfect example of that. He fell, um, he was walking down the stairs and he, um, him and my mom were still running a business and it was, um, it was, oh gosh, maybe November. And he was walking down our, our stairs and his shoelace was untied and he tripped and fell and fractured his left hip. And he died um, in July of that year. Um, he was diagnosed with leukemia and was um, dead within six weeks. Now you say, well, he had leukemia. Well, leukemia um, is a uh, disease of the blood cells. And we know that blood cells are made in the bone marrow. So um, he also had a, um, from what I understand, there was a, an environmental um, issue too, because he worked in um, a uh, shop with, with uh, beryllium for many years. Um, but anyways, um, and then I, I know uh, a lady I worked with, same thing happened to her grandmother, she fell. And again, within a year, um, she was gone working in a, in a nursing home. I've seen those statistics and it's pretty sad. So again, our job is to stand straight and keep moving and make sure make sure your shoes are tied, watch, walk out, uh, watch out for curbs. Um, when you go to the doctor now, they ask you, if um, you have fallen in the last six months and um, or in the last year and they're asking because they want to kind of capture that information and maybe see if it's trending um, with you and that if you've had another fall, what, what can they do to help you? Maybe you need some physical therapy. Um, maybe you need better shoes. So, you know, they're asking for a reason. So don't lie. If you, if you fell, the other question is, is uh, when you're walking, are you afraid to fall? And uh, the reason they ask that is because study shows that the more anxious you are about falling, the higher chance you have of falling. And so that's why they ask that question. Um, I have also experienced, if I could jump in a minute, that yeah, at one point I sort of felt that my balance was uh, becoming different than it had been when I was younger. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And so I did talk to my doctor about it and asked them about giving me a script to get some uh, occupational or physical therapy, uh, which they did. And I found that very helpful. You know, people think of that often that you just do that once you've broken a bone or had some other hospitalization, but it is worth thinking about, I think. And, and we have those um, with Medicare, um, yes. you know, you have those, those um, things available to you and you should be using them because it's not just um, balance really has a lot of different um, effects to it. And so you probably had to do the stand on one foot and see how long you could balance on one foot. I, I know I failed that miserably when I stood on my non-dominant foot. So, um, right. you know, the, the therapy will get you stronger and more mobile. Mm -hmm. So um, you were definitely proactive on that, Carol. Thanks for sharing. Certainly. Well, we appreciate everyone coming on today. Uh, I put uh, my personal contact information for ElderWorks in the chat box, but you also could call our office direct if you have other questions, which is 847-462-0885. Most importantly, we appreciate you completing the evaluation because we always like to hear your input. Uh, thank you so much to Chris Petrick, our training specialist, and also um, our expert, obviously, on all things as we age, uh, as well as many other topics. Uh, do check our YouTube channel as well, and uh, join us on Stepping Out for Fitness, which you can find on our website through our resources. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. And, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Be safe. Stay warm.